Brilliant. Go on, have a group of that. Get out of your seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jews, queens, and fellow characters, on behalf of City Hotel, welcome to Dunedin. Hey. Hey. Thank you. It's largest, it's friendliest, and without doubt, it's most beautiful city. Hey. Tonight, appropriately, you have the address to the haggis. Appropriate, because as Steve has told you, Dunedin is a Scottish city. Yep. The Edinburgh of the South Pacific, <laughs> founded by the Reverend Thomas Burns, nephew of Robert Burns, Scotland's national poet, and all that other tourist bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and what Steve has not told you is that Dunedin is the fourth largest city in area in the entire world. This makes it the largest Scottish city in the world. In fact, it is the only truly Scottish city in the world. The only city to be conceived, designed, built and settled by and for Scots people. All those places north of the English border are just accidents of history. <laughs> now when I say the word Scott to you, you'll immediately think of Alexander Graham Bell who invented the telephone. <laughs> you might think of Lachlan Macquarie, the father of Australia, or Alexander Hamilton who drafted the American Constitution. You might think of Logie Baird, who invented television, or Robert Service, Canada's national poet. Like hell you will. <laughs> You'll think of this. You'll think of bagpipes and kilts, tartans and whiskey, a shame and a disgrace. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've abandoned the genius of our nation for a few tart and spangles. <laughs> now, how did this come about? It came about as a result of these accidents of history I mentioned before. We are, of course, all accidents of history. Some of us more so than others. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years ago, the Irish sailed across the seas and took over the highlands of Scotland. Yeah. And then the French, understandably tired of living in France, they sailed across the Channel and took over England and the south of Ireland. This left the old Anglo-Saxon with nowhere to go, and they were squeezed north to settle in what is now the lowlands of Scotland where they are today. So what do we have today? Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a German queen who rules over the Gaelic-speaking Irish in the north, <laughs> the Franco-Latin-speaking English in the south, and the Anglo-Saxon, the true Scot in the middle, who speaks perfect English. <laughs> <laughs> this, of course, means the greatest poet in the English language is none other than Robert Burns. Because you now understand. Shakespeare was just a Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> we are no different to the rest of the world. We are just the same. We've run the usual gamut of disasters. We've suffered wars, famine, flood, disease, pestilence, politicians, you name it. <laughs> and we were to suffer along with the rest of the world another grave disaster. But this disaster, we were to suffer more than any other. It was none of the aforementioned. It was, in fact, a woman. The cruelest, cleverest woman the world has ever known. A woman who went forth and subjugated more peoples and destroyed more cultures than anyone before or since. This woman was Queen Victoria. Ooh. As a young lass, she paid a visit to the Harlands of Scotland. She liked the place. She decided to make it her holiday home, which is a polite way of saying, bugger off, I want your land. <laughs> Scots people are scattered all over the world. There are more people of Scots descent in the world today than any other people. <laughs> you don't believe me, man, because you just believe in your eyes. <laughs> I get one in every crowd. <laughs> Some lady thinks it's the Chinese. <laughs> Not so. True, China is the most populous country, but throughout the world there are more people of Scots descent. And a wager can prove it right here in this room tonight, although I've met none of you before. Now, hands up anybody that's got a wee bit of Scots blood in the veins. Hands up. Welsh. Uh, right, now, hands up all the Chinese blood in your veins. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got some work to do, madam. You better start tonight. <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden, there's a great popularity in all things Scottish. Overnight, Queen Victoria created the most sustained most profitable industry the world has ever seen, the tartan pantomime. At the same time, there was a rise in the popularity of the poetry of Robert Burns. And societies were formed not just in Scotland, but all over the world, 
to promulgate his works. And they chose, very interesting as their theme, the address to the Haggis. And they dressed, they dressed the Haggis up in the form of a Highland Chiefs procession. Oh! oh. I won't sleep in my shop. <laughs> <laughs> very Chiefs to his own beer bar or piper. And you're very lucky this evening, ladies and gentlemen, because the services of one of New Zealand's leading A grade pipers and bagpipe -pipe judges regularly represents the Needham throughout New Zealand and overseas. Most recently at the Edinburgh Military Tattoo, none other than Fight Major Stuart Officer. <laughs> Not too much, or he'll play again. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Stuart plays the great Highland War Pipe you know so well. An Irish instrument, brought by the Irish all those years ago and changed to its present form by the English Army in the 19th century. We're the fully back. This little skirt that you're so familiar with, invented in a factory in Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland by an Englishman. Tired of his labourers being tangled up in his machinery with the great plaid dog blanket that we wore, <laughs> he made us wear this little dress. <laughs> Next in the procession comes the Gilly Moore, the great servant. In the old days when you went out to dine and dance, you couldn't always trust your host and your fellow guest, so you made sure you kept your trusty sword close at hand. But it's very, very difficult to dine and dance when you've got a great weapon dangling between your legs. <laughs> you should be sorry. You should be ashamed of yourself. The very idea. I don't know. Excuse me, can you repeat that? <laughs> So you get someone like Michael here to hold your weapon for you. <laughs> a bit of applause there for Michael. Come on. Hey. So you've got to be free with the applause. It's not easy standing up here looking stupid. It's taking years of <laughs> Next come the chief himself. As Burns describes him, the chieftain of the pudding race, the humble haggis. Again, there's nothing unusual in a haggis. It's known to most peoples of the world. I was trying to wear any dingle last time he was over, and he was telling me the aboriginals of Western Australia had a haggis. It was, however, unbeknownst to the Highlanders of Scotland and the Irish. Haggis comes from an old English word, haggis, which means haggis. <laughs> it totally comes from an old French word, machis, which means Haggis. <laughs> At the end of the year, you killed your animals and you hung them up to dry, but you're left with all those lovely juicy bits like the lungs, the liver, the lights, oh. the chitterlings, the great intestine. <laughs> and you wouldn't waste those tasty morsels, would you, sir? Um, I didn't think you would, you miserable sod. <laughs> you chop them up, you mix them together with oatmeal and spices, you cook them in the animal's stomach to get the extra juices. And then you sell it to the tourists. It's a wonderful <laughs> idea. <laughs> I love it when you laugh, because this is your tea tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Many of the beans I have mentioned are no longer used. In fact, truly, today it's just lamb pate. You will enjoy it. It's strongly flavoured, quite delicious, but a wee word of warning. If you're not used to it, do be careful, because it is renowned for its extremely important aphrodisiacal properties, and these can be embarrassed you later on to have. <laughs> Next in the procession comes the gilly cow. Most important person, the gilly cow, because it's their job to advise the chief on affairs of state and matters of etiquette. Tonight, your gilly cow is Anne. Hey. <laughs> I was just chatting to Steve before the show, just finding out about my volunteers. He's look, John, you've got no worries tonight. I've got you three good ones. And good sport, good fun, she'll join in. <laughs> just got them all backstage before, and they're all a wee bit shaky, as you can un understand. And so I was just trying to calm them down, settle their nerves, as you do, you know. And I have to say to Anne, I says, well, Anne, are you with anyone on tour? Oh, yes, yes, says Anne, I'm with anyone. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Now comes the one thing we can call our own. The one thing that is truly Scottish. The greatest meat sauce ever invented. Haggis sauce, otherwise known to you as Scotch whiskey. <laughs> invented by those great inventors of booze, the monks. In particular, tradition has it, a monk by the name of Patrick. 
He invented his great trick and then went to Ireland, where the Irish in their wisdom made him their saint. And tonight, your gilly whiskey is Vin. <laughs> so, why does Vin get to carry the whiskey? I hear you ask. Oh, yeah. Yeah, why does he carry it? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Look at these legs, ladies and gentlemen. Show us your legs, Vin. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, these are the legs of an athlete. <laughs> You may not realise, but these guys have known for some time they're going to do the show. So they've been getting up every morning at five o'clock, going out training just to be fit for the occasion. <laughs> In fact, I believe this very morning they'd gone for the usual run and they'd managed maybe five, ten kilometres or so there. And Anne turns to the others and says, You know, guys, when I get back to the hotel, I'm going to go into the kitchen and make myself a nice cup of tea. Oh, 15, 20 kilometres goes by there, whatever it was, and Michael turns to the others and says, Well, think, guys, when I get back to the hotel, I'm going to go into the kitchen too. But I'm going to pull open the fridge and tear the top off a lovely cold beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, 25, 30, 40, 50 kilometres go by, whatever it was there, and Ben turns to Michael and says, Oh, Michael, Michael, when I get back to the hotel, I'm going to go into the kitchen, but I'm going to go through the kitchen, along the corridor. I'm going to go up the stairs, into the bedroom, and I'm going to tear Anne's knickers off. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Michael was absolutely mortified. <laughs> he was horrified. He was disgusted. You name it, he was it. I beg your pardon, Vin, says he. We've run all this way, and you're going to go upstairs and do what? Oh, yes, Vin says, the damn things are killing me. 